Good morning. I'm Mark Scheinberg. I'm president of Goodwin College, and I'm so tickled to have you here. It was mentioned that you, you just say two words, and in the civilian audience, they keep on talking. The military audience goes quiet like that, and so it uh, made me smile. Uh, first of all, welcome. We're, as I said, we're so pleased to have you here. Uh, Goodwin College has been on this campus, we're working on this campus for now just for about nine or ten years, and so you see us as a young college growing and, and, uh, and uh, very aware of the fact that everything that we're doing is for us new and is a legacy and is a precedent. And so um, as part of that, we are, uh, we're so pleased to do everything we can for all of our organizations. The uh, World Affairs Council is one of the treasures of Connecticut in that they bring such important people here for us to understand what's going on in the world in real time. And we're also just so pleased to have to be involved with the honor that's being given to us by having such heroes here today uh, in the veteran community. We are always aware, always aware of, of um, how much everything we get to do is because of all the gifts that have been protected for us by our, our, our military. And so uh, we have a very active military organization, veterans organization on the campus, and we are just happy to have you here sharing that with us. Um, so, you guys have a very, very busy day. I just want to make sure I was here to, to uh, send you off, and I'd like to introduce uh, for you uh, our first district congressman, who, again, is uh, one of the great heroes of, uh, of, of, of defense in this area, of the military in this area, uh, and has a great sense of history and the importance of everything you guys are trying to do. Uh, congressman John Larson. Well, thank you, Mark, and uh, welcome to East Hartford and Goodwin College. Uh, Mark has done such an extraordinary uh, job here, and uh, uh, so has the World Affairs Council. We enjoy uh, collaborating when we can. I'm glad to see Arthur House here. We recently talked about an issue I know you're going to be discussing today about cybersecurity, and our office is working hand in glove with him to see <clears throat> what we can do legislatively. Uh, this morning, however, uh, I wanted to announce a project that we're doing in conjunction uh, with Goodwin College. We're calling it the Fallen Star at Goodwin College. Some of you may know about the Fallen Star at uh, Aberdeen Training Grounds in Maryland. Uh, but it was a concept that was uh, conceived to honor uh, all veterans who have died in service. And Two years ago, they added a gold star mother. And here at Goodwin College, we're going to replicate it, except it's going to be grander and better with a star representing those who have given the full measure of their devotion with a bench with a gold star mother looking at it with a father with his arm on the shoulder of the mother. Uh, we think that this will be an outstanding tribute. We have been to Aberdeen to look at it. Ours will be a little more expansive, <clears throat> and people will be able to see it from Route 2, and it will be placed here at Goodwin College in conjunction with the outstanding work that Goodwin is doing with veterans as well. So welcome here to the college. You'll be hearing more from, uh, from us about this. Paul Buka has generously uh, agreed to spearhead this effort along with uh, uh, several others in the area. I hope uh, we can gain your interest as well. We think this is going to be a fantastic thing and a great way uh, to recognize uh, those who have given the full measure of their devotion for their country. Thank you and great success this morning. So again, good morning, everyone. I'm Megan Torrey, the Executive Director of the World Affairs Council, and I want to thank you all for taking time on your Saturday to be with us. Uh, it's an honor uh, to host the Global Security Forum here at Goodwin College, um, and I am going just to take a few minutes of your time to thank all of our sponsors today. So as you can imagine, a program that's this large um, with speakers of the caliber that we have today uh, is not easy to put together, so I want to thank our partners that 
allowed us to do this. Uh, so thank you to Stanley Security, to Command, uh, of course, our partner with Goodwin College, who are hosting us today, the Mohegan Tribe, uh, Harford Business Journal, USAA, the Retired Officers Association, um, the Military Officers Association. And so our partner for today is the Military Officers Association of America, Charter Oak Chapter. And I want to introduce our host for today, Colonel Robert Hill. Thank you, Megan. We're really privileged uh, to be a partner in, the, in, in this, this event. Uh, and we want to welcome you to it. This is the premier event on global security in all of New England. And I think uh, you'll agree that it's uh, uh, really a significant thing when you look at the, sp at the uh, speakers we have and the subjects that we're going to cover. Uh, at this time, I would like you all to rise and do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one God, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm Bob Hill. Uh, I'm uh, uh, president of the uh, Charter Oak chapter of the Military Officers Association, uh, and I'm also uh, an ambassador uh, for the uh, uh, Chief of uh, the Army Reserve. Uh, and I welcome you on behalf of the Chief of Army Reserve uh, to this event. Uh, I'd like to just give you a few housekeeping uh, uh, memos. Uh, first of all, the restrooms down this hall to the, right, the left and then to the left again. Um, uh, we're going to, uh, uh, I will try to be very uh, uh, short on the introductions to our people because you have your program there and uh, I don't want to take up a lot of time on introductions when you can be getting some, a real message from, uh, from our people. Uh, during the uh, uh, question and answer period, uh, we would ask that you not make statements but uh, actually ask questions. <laughs> Uh, the speakers, <laughs> so you, you ask the questions, the speakers will answer the questions. <laughs> um, uh, the, uh, uh, other than that, I think we're ready to move right into our first panel. And uh, our first panel today is the return of nuclear arms racing. And it's going to be moderated by Ellen uh, Lapson. Uh, Ellen has held positions in the State Department, the National Security Council, and the Congressional Research Service, in addition to being a weekly columnist for worldpoliticalviews.com. Ellen Lapson joins us now as a director of the International Security Program at the Shar School of Government and Public Policy at George Mason University. Please welcome Helen Lapson. So thank you, Mr. Hill, for the nice introduction, and we're delighted to be here. It's such a pleasant space. Uh, it's a slightly serious topic that we're beginning the day with. I think the whole theme of this conference is, is the world becoming uh, a less secure place. But I hope our panel will give you a little of insight and background into how to think about the nuclear issues um, and nonproliferation and the, the possibility that things are getting worse. So we, we raise the question, should we be worried? Is the world becoming more dangerous from the perspective of developments in the specific area of nuclear weapons. We've all been reading about the North Korean crisis on the front page of the papers or in the news, but we're gonna go beyond that. We're gonna look at other developments in the nuclear uh, field related to the Iran agreement, related to US-Russia relations, and maybe even a little bit of India-Pakistan if, if that comes up. Uh, but we have two wonderful speakers that I think will bring a lot of wisdom and experience to the topic. Jim Walsh is at MIT. Uh, he is really one of the national voices on uh, nonproliferation and partic with particular recent experience on the Iran agreement. He has been to both Iran and North Korea, has talked to uh, f figures in those negotiations over what to do about the nuclear uh, activities in those two countries. So I know that Jim has, is always um, out in public uh, conversations and really is a very authoritative voice on how to manage and avoid conflict and avoid things getting worse uh, in, the, in the nuclear arena. 
And um, uh, Dr. Cooper is from uh, the Naval War College, a uh, distinguished civilian career in the Defense Department, was involved very early on in a Bush administration initiative called the Proliferation Security Initiative, negotiating with a number of countries on how to prevent uh, further spread of nuclear and other uh, weapons of mass destruction materials and weapons around the world. Um, he's currently the chair of the uh, strategy department. <coughs> National uh, Security. National Bears. Security um, uh, Department at the Naval War College. So gets, has the, the big picture and is helping train the next generation of naval officers that will be uh, responsible for managing these issues uh, into the future. So the way we're going to proceed is um, each of our speakers will make some opening remarks that perhaps will, will give slightly different perceptions of uh, how scary is this moment? Um, how worried should we be? Are things getting worse? Um, and then we'll, we'll have a conversation among the three of us, and then we'll open it up to you for your own questions and, and concerns. Uh, Jim, would you like to go first? Sure. Mm -hmm. First of all, let me begin by thanking all of you for coming out on a Saturday morning. <laughs> it was supposed to rain, and you still drag yourself out here. It's a terrific turnout. I, you know, I knew it was going to be a good event because when I was driving in from Cambridge this morning, I saw one of the biggest, brightest rainbows I've ever ah. seen from the highway. <laughs> I don't know if any of you saw that. And I'm honored to be with this distinguished panel, and I want to thank the organizers. You know, uh, great events like this don't just happen on their own. It requires a lot of work, and I appreciate the work that Amanda and, and more generally uh, that everyone has done. But let me get to it. So I have some good news and I have some bad news. So let me first start by providing a little context. How worried should we be about the spread of nuclear weapons or the potential for nuclear conflict? Well, I always find it helpful to put this in some sort of historical context. And when you look at the history, you find a rather uh, surprising thing. You know, we all have a model in our heads of how nuclear weapons spread. You know, the Nazis had a program, so we got a program. And when we got a program, the Russians and the Chinese got a program. And when the Chinese got one, the Indians did, and the PACs followed Indians. And you go two, four, six, eight, and off it spreads. And I think that's the model in our heads, that it just sort of cascades with ever-growing numbers. And that was certainly the predictions by virtually every uh, government official and scholars that we would have sort of just a cascading uh, a set of proliferators. Turns out that did not happen. Did not happen. If you look at the rate of proliferation, the number of new nuclear weapon states each decade, how many new countries joined the nuclear weapons club each decade? That peaked in the 1970s when three states joined the nuclear weapons club, uh, China, France, and Israel. But since the 1970s, in every succeeding decade, fewer and fewer countries have joined the nuclear weapons club. Since the 1990s, more countries have given up their nuclear weapons assets than have acquired them. And not only were the predictions wrong, uh, they really didn't capture the fact that today we have fewer countries interested in acquiring nuclear weapons than really any point in the 70 years of the nuclear age. In the 50s and 60s, there were dozens of countries that were interested in nuclear weapons. Some 30 countries started down the path towards nuclear weapons, stopped and reversed course. So this is a, a real success story. Uh, one of the biggest public policy successes of the 20th century that people don't recognize. So we have a record of success, and really what we ought to be trying to do is build on that record using the tools we have, uh, alliances and non-proliferation agreements and the other foreign policy tools we have to build on that success. So that's the good news. <laughs> I will say that as we look on the horizon, uh, there are reasons for concern about being able to build on that great track record. And, and two areas, I'll just briefly speak to two things that concern me. One is Iran. Right now we have Iran locked in a multinational nuclear agreement uh, in which they've been uh, required to ship 98% of their nuclear material out of Iran, where they've had to destroy their plutonium reactor in Iraq where they have at all their sensitive nuclear facilities 24-7 electronic monitoring uh, to make sure that there's no funny business going on. And we've really had these agreements with Iran now for, if you go back to the interim agreement, the first agreement, have been in place now for three and a half years. So we have some data here to tell us whether it's working or not. And at least according to the International Atomic Energy Agency, our own intelligence community, uh, those of our allies and our partners, Iran has complied with its obligations, its nuclear obligations under the agreement. So I consider that a win. There is some concern, however, that over the coming months, uh, 
the United States may decide to take actions that would have the effect of uh, pulling out of the agreement and destroying the agreement. And if that happens, all those constraints on Iran will be removed, and they will be free to return to spending thousands of centrifuges, and that uh, enhanced monitoring, the most intrusive uh, on any state uh, ever in the history of the nuclear age, that monitoring will also uh, likely be withdrawn. So I worry about that both from a proliferation standpoint and uh, about the loss of the agreement itself, but also that the loss of the agreement may then lead to a cycle uh, that might ultimately result in the use of military force, which itself, either Iran being out of the agreement or a use of military force, could have significant nonproliferation implications. It might lead either Iran to decide to change course and pursue a nuclear weapon, or following that, it may lead others in the region who fear what Iran might do to try to do the same. So I think we're really at an inflection point uh, in the Middle East. We've achieved a major diplomatic victory that has achieved our security goals. And then the question is, are we going to continue to do that, or are we going to fall back and face an uncertain future? And then finally, and just very quickly, uh, North Korea. So I've followed North Korea for some 15 years now, having been to the DPRK and meeting with uh, Korean officials over many, many years. I am not a threat hyper. I've spent most of my life, uh, professional life, uh, jousting with people who I believe, for different reasons, have tended to exaggerate the threats that the US faces. We are a very safe country, in my view. Um, and so when I say I'm more worried about North Korea than I have been since maybe 1994, when I said that on Facebook, it freaked out all my Facebook friends. Uh, and my concern is not a deliberate war. Uh, Chairman Kim is going to launch a war he knows he's going to lose, and he would certainly lose and lose badly. No, my worry is inadvertent war. War by miscalculation, by misperception, and by mistake. And when you look at the conditions right now that are in place, a lot of the conditions for an inadvertent war are there. We have a lot of bluster and bluffing. We have adversaries who don't understand each other very much. We have poor or no lines of communication. In the case of Mr. Kim, I worry that those purges that he has engaged in, more so than his father or his grandfather, uh, create a permissive environment, uh, as with Saddam on the eve of the Kuwait war, in which he may decide to do something stupid, and who of his aides is going to raise his hand and say, boss, this is a dumb idea, because that's a quick way to a firing squad. So I think that's just some of the conditions that are in play now. And so I'm very, very, very much concerned about that. And so in summary, I think it makes it even more important that we consolidate our victories, and in this case, preventing Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon, and then focus on preventing a nuclear weapon state one who actually has nuclear weapons from taking actions that might lead to a, an outcome we haven't seen in decades, so that Americans really have no grasp of what that would mean. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Dave Cooper, would you like to make some opening remarks? Thank you very much. I, I should start by saying that all of the views I'm going to give are my own. Um, oh, I was supposed to say that on our behalf. <laughs> okay, I was supposed to say on all of our behalfs that we're here be giving individual views. We don't represent the institutions where we may work. Okay, sorry about that. No, I promised you I was going to do that, and I didn't. No, but I, that's important because I'm actually going to um, take a somewhat more pessimistic uh, view uh, than, than Jim. I, I don't disagree uh, with anything. Uh, the history has been a very successful history, uh, but it's also been a very short history. Uh, the advent of nuclear weapons are within living memory. Uh, the advent of the modern period in which we've been dealing uh, with this uh, is the post-Cold War era, uh, which is uh, only over the last quarter century. Uh, and we're heading into uh, what many perceive as a uh, period of power uh, transition in the international system to greater multipolarity, um, which really is an unknown. Uh, so that I think uh, we cannot count necessarily on the paradigms we have counted on. Uh, I would suggest uh, we've had a paradigm of distinguishing uh, between nuclear disarmament, uh, those who have and are allowed to have but should reduce, and nuclear nonproliferation trying to prevent anyone who doesn't have uh, in this status quo arrangement uh, from, from getting more. Uh, my view is that we may be coming to the end of that paradigm uh, and that we may be facing a paradigm uh, that I uh, would 
coin as trans-regional uh, arms racing. Uh, let me step back and uh, give some perspectives on that. Uh, we have India and Pakistan. I am very pessimistic uh, that they are having uh, a mini bilateral arms race between them uh, that doesn't get a lot of attention but continues apace. I don't have much optimism that that can be resolved in any bilateral arrangements between them because although Pakistan is arms racing with India, India is not nuclear arms racing with Pakistan. India's eyes are on China. India has a conventional superiority over Pakistan. It's Pakistan that needs the nuclear weapons to counter that. So for India, it's about China. I'm very pessimistic that the Intermediate Nuclear uh, Forces Treaty, the INF Treaty, uh, will survive. Uh, the Russians have been signaling since uh, 2000, uh, I'm sorry, since uh, 2007 uh, that unless the treaty is expanded to include other countries, by which they mean China, uh, that they cannot tolerate it anymore. Uh, they used to do us the courtesy of uh, cheating while trying to hide it. Uh, the big development here is uh, they are now overtly cheating um, in a way that can't be missed. I think this treaty is probably not long for the world. Uh, the reason for that is because however much uh, President Putin uh, will go on about NATO, uh, INF forces for Russia are really about China because it is China that has a conventional superiority over that vast land border. Uh, so. I do not believe that we can tolerate Russia pursuing INF and uh, continuing to have its advantage in tactical nuclear weapons uh, by a 10 to 1 um, without responding, uh, and so we will need to do that. Which brings us all back to China. I don't see China finally bellying up to the bar uh, to put its own nuclear weapons programs uh, into any sort of negotiated uh, situation simply because, refer back to India, Russia, <coughs> and us, and our allies, Japan, South Korea, and whatnot. Uh, China, uh, I think, uh, has been uh, having a unilateral arms race very successfully without people noticing. Uh, we may notice now, but I think that will continue apace. So I, I do think we are going to get this phenomenon of transnational arms racing uh, in the future. Uh, it's not inevitable, but I, I think it's a very real possibility. Um, now, unfortunately, that's the best case scenario. <laughs> um, because I've only talked about those countries that already have nuclear weapons um, and are now uh, engaging in what we call uh, 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 I'm sorry, vertical proliferation versus horizontal uh, proliferation. Uh, in terms of uh, North Korea, uh, I, like everyone else, uh, am very pessimistic. Uh, but I think if this is not resolved, uh, we are seeing uh, Japan and South Korea uh, engaging in very quiet but serious domestic uh, debates uh, about whether they will need to uh, acquire nuclear weapons. I'm less sanguine about Iran for reasons uh, I can get into, um, but if in the long run uh, Iran uh, does become a nuclear weapons power, then at least Saudi Arabia, uh, if not other regional uh, states, uh, would I think respond, and I think Israel uh, would respond uh, by uh, eliminating its policy of ambiguity uh, and declare itself uh, a, uh, a nuclear power. So I, I do think we have a possibility. What we've done for the last 15 years is we have been incredibly successful at kicking a can down the road and keeping a lid on it. That is a good news story, except there's a possibility when you've kicked the can on the road and kept the lid on it, that the pressure builds up to the point that where it pops, it can pop not incrementally, um, but in, in, in rather dramatic ways. Uh, where could this go in the end? Uh, well. We see actual conversations in Western Europe about the need for uh, Western Europe to have its independent nuclear power, uh, nuclear weapons capability, whether that's uh, the French program uh, through extended deterrence or something else. Um, there are conversations in Australia about the need to think about becoming a nuclear weapons power. Uh, Ambassador Martin Letts, uh, who uh, was uh, the longtime Australian, uh, disarmament ambassador, a left lefty labor disarmament anti-nuclear global zero person uh, basically said Australia needs to understand that if this all goes bad uh, it needs to start thinking about whether it needs its own uh, independent nuclear weapons force. So I do think uh, none of this is inevitable um, but I 
do not think the fact that none of this has happened uh, makes none of this happening inevitable either. Thank you. All right, so we have a lot to talk about. There's a, a lot of issues here. Um, I think a lot of what um, Dave Cooper has presented is about how countries other than the United States interact with each other. So Russia, China, India, Pakistan, et cetera. But you've also raised the, the, the undeniable reality that American power in absolute and relative terms has shifted and that the, United, the world result revolves less around what the U.S. wants and what the U.S. declares as the agenda than it used to. And this is not a, a partisan statement. It's an evolution through a number of uh, administrations. It is just that there was that unique moment after the Cold War, and sooner or later, that was going to evolve into something else. And I think what we have seen is just in, in measure both intangible and tangible ways a shift in wh how American power shapes the world agenda less than before. So I want to turn to you Jim and help us understand what will it mean if the US says we don't really support the Iran agreement anymore? What will other parties to that agreement do? Will the agreement still be in effect or not? So we have the US sort of voluntarily possibly taking itself out of some of the agreements that it itself was a negotiator of. Um, so help us understand, can other countries just keep moving forward without the United States? How, how do you think that will play out? Well, I cannot say for certain. There are uh, certainly a couple of different scenarios, and I had the opportunity to sit down with Foreign Minister Zarif, the Foreign Minister of Iran, a week ago in the residence in New York, and we discussed this issue. I think, uh, Basically, if the U.S. unilaterally pulls out of the agreement, uh, the you own it, uh, you break it, you own it uh, saying comes into play, will be seen as having been responsible for that outcome, and then that will give the Iranians complete freedom of action. They can decide, uh, you know, one, one, there are two basic scenarios. They can say, all right, the U.S. is out, we'll continue to abide by the agreement, but we'll continue to carry on relations with the Europeans, uh, the Russians and the Chinese, so that we'll continue to be able to trade and enjoy economic benefits, and we will uh, simply isolate the United States. The, uh, but there is this thing called domestic politics, and it's true in Iran as much as it is true in the United States. Uh, in fact, the politics is very fierce. So Rouhani and Foreign Minister Zarif have come under intense criticism from hardliners and an occasional criticism from the Supreme Leader that said, you know, you've negotiated this deal and now the U.S. is, you know, not fully implementing it according to their perceptions and it's, they're calling us names and blah, 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 blah. You know, we warned you, you shouldn't deal with the U.S. And so if that agreement collapses, uh, while it might be in Iran's self-interest simply to isolate the U.S. and to carry, to act as if the agreement were in place and to maintain its relationships with the Europeans and the other negotiating partners, it might be that the hardliners are so emboldened by this defeat for President Rouhani uh, that they will really press for a clean break. I mean, there's some point at which the Iranians will say, because of domestic pressure, enough is enough, you know, we're done here. And if, if they do that, then I, I would expect they'll go back to their playbook and they will take the centrifuges out of storage, or more, even more likely, they may d deploy new, far more efficient centrifuges uh, the old P1s are, are, are pretty bad. Uh, and then what will happen then? Then you'll have voices in the U.S. who say, look, Iran is, the, in fact, some of the same voices who said we should pull out of the agreement, they will turn on a dime and say, look, there's no agreement. Uh, and Iran is enriching. Mm -hmm. We have to do right. something. Right. And we'll have to have, uh, think about the use of military force. And you already see that in the op-ed pages where people are calling for that. But I wondered whether there was a different, uh, whether maybe the administration is hoping for a, a sort of have your cake and eat it too solution, which is that they don't certify Iran is in compliance, but no, neither do they report that Iran is in material breach yes, yes. that would trigger a formal, uh, not renegotiation, but some kind of formal adjudication by all the parties to the treaty to say, is there material breach or not? The administration seems to understand that it doesn't have evidence to say Iran is in material breach. They have not oh, intentionally broken the provisions of the agreement. 
the US as a unilateral act could say, we no longer want to certify this stuff. Mm -hmm. But the agreement would still remain legally in place, wouldn't it? Yeah, but I'm afraid yeah. that that might be just too clever by half. Uh -huh. And it also does not prohibit the president from going to the UN Security Council and alleging uh, that Iran is in the breach mm -hmm. at, at following decertification. Mm -hmm. uh, snapback sanctions can be invoked for, you know, you, for any even reason without, without evidence. Even without evidence. And then it's yeah. automatic. That's the yeah. whole idea behind snapback sanctions is that they would be mm -hmm. automatic. Um, I reason why I say it, it might be too clever by half is uh, what uh, Ellen's referring to is the president, well, there's national, there's the international agreement and then there's national legislation mm -hmm. passed by Congress. By each country that was yes. a, a signatory. Yes, and we have uh, a, a Congress pact passed an act with respect to the Iran nuclear agreement. And uh, essentially what happens is if the president decertifies, that will free Congress, or in some cases invite Congress, to impose new sanctions. And if they impose new sanctions, uh, if they sort of take the old sanctions that were on nuclear, cross out nuclear at the top, and write in something else, missiles or human rights or whatever, that's going to be seen as bad faith on the part mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the Iranians. Right. And so the problem is, does decertification lead to sanctions which are a violation of the agreement, uh, and then on to its collapse? And then we are in non-compliance. Right, right. <laughs> but you know, I think also uh, the fundamental thing to keep in mind here is Agreements work when all parties see benefits. Mm -hmm. no, no sovereign state's going to stay in an agreement and do things for the other side if it's not seeing that it's getting the things that it was promised. Right. And so you know, the thing is you don't want to cross that point where the uh, Iranians say, why are we in this agreement? You know, mm -hmm. Because we're getting nothing for it. And uh, you know, it's the same old system, only we're living under all these obligations. And so I, I worry about the sustainability of that. Mm -hmm. Hey, Dr. Cooper, I want to switch to, you brought us, you gave us a broad brush view of some of the big kind of geostrategic moving parts that are uh, going on in the world. So we've got uh, China as a player in the India-Pak dynamic. We certainly have China as a player in the North Korean crisis with everybody's wish or hope that China will put more pressure on the North Koreans, uh, knowing that there's more interdependence or that North Korea is more dependent on China than on the US, certainly. But what I haven't heard, and I wonder whether you either think it should exist or shouldn't exist, is a US-China dialogue about nuclear questions. Uh, we, we have the Chinese involved as a player, both in their UN hat on, on the Iran agreement. China is a player in the, the, the dormant six-party talks on North Korea. But do you see a, a need for a U.S.-China dialogue on uh, nuclear dangers, uh, the nuclear landscape? Let me give you a very quick answer to that, and then I'd like mm -hmm. to just uh, respond a little um, on the Iran deal. The, the answer very quickly is yes. Um, we've had a need for that for a while. The problem is it takes two to tango. Mm -hmm. And frankly, the Chinese have been very skillful at having uh, their disarmament cake and eating it too. Um, the Chinese position is that it's shocking and terrible that Russia and the United States have not done more uh, to meet their disarmament commitments under the MPT. Um, meanwhile, all nuclear powers under the MPT have been reducing their forces, other than China, which mm -hmm. has been elevating its forces. Um, under that circumstance, it's not really in China's interest to talk. And when uh, we have engaged with China and said, gee, uh, even a little transparency, um, China says things like, well, you know, we, we have a minimal nuclear deterrent. Well, what does that mean, mm -hmm. minimal? You, you don't really need to know much more than that. Uh, the Chinese formula is uh, US and Russia, you keep coming down. We won't tell you what we have, but when you come close to us, we'll tell you and then we can talk. That's essentially been the Chinese position for the last 15 years and I don't really see them having a motive other than if they get scared enough on this North Korean situation, um, to do anything. If I may quickly on Please. the Iran deal, um, I was an opponent of the Iran deal. Uh, I testified uh, against the deal primarily saying that if it did not include the ballistic missiles, um, that there was a real uh, intention uh, question uh, there. I am also an opponent of pulling out of the deal for all the reasons uh, that, that Jim mentioned. Um, at this point, uh, the, uh, the things that Iran has done for the deal are relatively easily reversible. I might even 
uh, point out that uh, the nuclear materials that were shipped to Russia, if Russia believed that Iran had uh, you know, sort of uh, been uh, done ill to, uh, it's not inconceivable that those could be shipped right back. Uh, versus the sanctions uh, are not going to snap back. Uh, that, that's obvious. So I actually uh, oppose the deal. I think it's a bad deal. I think President Trump uh, is right about that. But I also think it would be foolish at this time uh, to pull out. Uh, essentially, uh, Iran would keep most of the gain. The US would get almost all of the blame. Um, why do I say it's a bad deal? Um, it's not because I worry that Iran is going to cheat. As a matter of fact, I think the Iranians are far too smart to cheat on this deal because they got too good a deal. Cheating puts them at risk. Um, the problem with this deal is uh, the potential for Iran just to abide by it and wait it out. And to me, the, uh, the long-range missile programs are the tell. Uh, Iran got what it wanted when it blew through those restrictions um, without any consequence. So uh, the missiles are a very good litmus test of nuclear weapons intention. As a matter of fact, in historical terms, uh, they are an absolute litmus test. Uh, there is no country that has pursued indigenous long-range ballistic missiles that has not also been pursuing nuclear weapons, sometimes covertly, and we only found out about the nuclear weapons program later. But those missiles are always the tell. Conversely, there's no country that has made a genuine decision to give up nuclear weapons that has not also given up its associated ballistic missile program. So the fact that Iran viewed those missiles as non-negotiable from the beginning, um, and the fact that they were willing to take uh, the political risk of blowing through uh, those uh, tells me uh, that there is a reason for concern that Iran has not made a strategic decision uh, to give up nuclear weapons. And in fact, uh, the missiles really are the long pole in their tent. Um, so they're allowed to continue pursuing the peace that they hadn't quite gotten done um, in a timeline that is pretty consistent um, with when they would expect to get there, um, except now they're pursuing those missiles uh, flush with money from sanctions relief and with the legitimacy of the agreement. So I'm, I'm opposed to the agreement, but I do not think we should pull out of it because we, we have what we have now and we just need to work our way through it. But I do not believe that the agreement is a reason to feel sanguine that we have solved the Iran nuclear missile, I'm uh, sorry, nuclear weapon uh, issue. I, I, I believe at best that is an open question. Well, I think if we try to compare a little bit Iran and North Korea, we've got two countries that, in a way by choice, are isolated, uh, feel vulnerable, see the world around them as hostile to them, et cetera, and they make different choices about what they need to feel secure. So I could make the argument, uh, not that I'm trying to be the defender of the Iranians, that uh, in a way giving up their nuclear program and the missiles at the same time would make them feel very insecure and that Part of this is the psychology within the country of feeling that they have some options to defend themselves against hostile outside powers. Again, we, we can debate that. But what I, I guess I wanted to ask both of you to think about, just to get a little bit more, zoom in a little bit more on how do we get out of this m moment of, of uh, tension with North Korea, mm. is that in the Iran case, in the end, the economic arguments were compelling to the Iranian government, that the Iranian government did feel that when they made the cost-benefit analysis, a big society, a society that was restless, a more advanced country in terms of level of education, economic development, et cetera, that in the end, the, the economic argument was compelling. In the North Korea case, it doesn't seem that economics alone is of interest uh, to them, that, that there's, they're at a different level of either insecurity or overconfidence. Um, so what are the leverage points on North Korea? And I wonder if you would agree with that comparison that in the Iran case, it turned out that the economic uh, coercive diplomacy pieces or the, or the inducements, the incentives on economics were, were uh, persuasive in the end. Of that doesn't seem to be the case in North Korea. Any other comparisons you would make between the Iran and North Korean case? and whether, if economic pressure doesn't work, what might work with North Korea? Yeah, I do think yeah. there are apples and oranges. Yeah. Uh, not only does one have a nuclear weapon and the other doesn't, they find themselves in radically different regional circumstances and economic circumstances, and domestic circumstances for that matter. I mean, the Iranians have an economy that's based on oil, which requires international trade. Uh, the North Koreans, not so much. 
Uh, the supreme leader may be the supreme leader, but he didn't like the Green Revolution in 2009, has to at least keep an ear to mm -hmm. uh, his domestic population. I mean, they, have a, they do have elections, and they have elections where there are surprises. I remember being in Tehran uh, for a meeting and sitting across a Russian, and I said, well, and it was on the even of an Iranian election, I said, well, uh, you know, one thing we know is we already know who the winner of the Russian election is, uh -huh. and we don't know who the winner <laughs> of the Iranian election is going to be. Um, so I, I think for the North Koreans, I think, uh, if I may just take a moment, it's easy to think of them as crazy, uh, but they do have, uh, they find themselves in a difficult situation from a national security standpoint, if you're sitting in Pyongyang. Remember, it was the Soviet Union that founded North Korea, not China. The uh, Chinese and the North Koreans actually don't like each other very much. Um, and so when this, the biggest event for North Korea, probably in its history, other than its founding, was the collapse of the Soviet Union. You know, in a snap of a finger, they lost their major security guarantor, uh, they lost economic aid, they lost all the trade with the satellite countries in Eastern Europe, and they quickly descended into a famine, uh, you know, because of the government's own incompetency, but a famine is a famine. When I was in Pyongyang, I was told in one of these long rides as I was forced to go from museum to museum, uh, that um, they see themselves as mice surrounded by elephants. Japan is a great power. The U.S. is a great power. Russia is a great power. Uh, China is a great power. And they actually fear that the Chinese and the U.S. are going to cut a deal and leave them out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when the world is falling apart around you and you, your main purpose is to stay in power, I wouldn't have recommended the nuclear course, but I'm not shocked uh, that they did it. But I do think that they're fundamentally different situations, but can be linked in this, and I think we can get into sanctions. I have a, have a study I conducted with my colleague from Harvard, John Park, last year, where we interviewed North Korean defectors whose job was to beat sanctions. So we have a pretty good beat on that, and I'm not very optimistic about sanctions as a tool that was going to be right. the magic wand that solves this. My own view is, uh, uh, and it's right that it takes two to tango, or in this case maybe four or six, but at the end of the day, the party's going to have to sit down at the negotiating table without precondition. What we have now is uh, two of the most important parties say on one day they want to talk, and on another day they aren't going to talk. And then they say, okay, I want to talk, but you have to, in the case uh, of the North Koreans, uh, North Koreans, you have to denuclearize before we sit down and talk. Well, why talk if you're, <laughs> there's no reason to talk if they already do the thing you want that you're supposed to get from the negotiation. So I think we need to put all our preconditions aside. This is the history of successful diplomacy. You sit at the table, everybody gets to say what they want. No one gets to you know, play cop on that, but you keep talking. And even if you don't get an agreement, at least you're talking and keeping a line of communication open. Because as I say, the major danger here is war uh, by inadvertent escalation, miscalculation, misperception. And so I'm a old school, I believe hold your friends close and your enemies closer, and so I think we need to be talking to them and, and that that will help uh, advance our national security interests. So do you think this is a moment for diplomacy or do you think that some of the military deterrence measures are more likely to diffuse this conflict? Well, I do think we are at a, uh, a very fraught moment. Um, I, I would say I, I think it's been overstated. Uh, I'm going to a conference. Uh, in Pearl Harbor uh, in two weeks, and I go with an easy heart. Um, I, I don't think North Korea today uh, is capable of delivering a nuclear weapon uh, to Hawaii or, or even Guam. Um, so in that sense, I think they are hyping, and that has been hyped. Um, but I do stress today, um, this, this day is coming very quickly. Uh, I think uh, despite President Trump's uh, one suspects ad-libbing a bit. Uh, there is a very deliberate doctrine uh, that Secretary of Defense Mattis articulated. Uh, it is a new and very significant doctrine. Uh, President Trump uh, ad-libbed, uh, I think, a bit. Uh, but uh, when President Trump threatened to destroy North Korea, um, he, he was stating the Mattis formula. He just got some indelicate words in there. Uh, the, Mattis, the Mattis formula, is that if the U.S. perceives 
that North Korea is imminently about to threaten the United States or our allies, that that will result in our uh, taking action uh, and that that could destroy uh, the current North Korean regime. So that's, that's that subtle difference. So we, we're in a period of brinksmanship. It actually makes sense because we are at the point where North Korea is poised to be able to make good on the threats they're currently making. They're not there yet. Uh, we're also at a point of maximum uh, discomfiture by the Chinese because of their domestic political situation right now. Um, the Chinese want to focus uh, on their own party conference coming up, not on an international crisis. So I actually think it's pretty smart to force the issue right now. I think this is a point of maximum leverage by the United States. That said, uh, it is very fraught, and brinksmanship uh, is, is rife with the potential for miscalculation. I also think we need to look, well, where is the end game? Um, and the end game really does come down to China. Um, but I, I am not sure uh, where that goes. The, the one possible negotiated solution that I can see as I have you know, sort of scratched my head is something I've never heard anyone talking about. Uh, and, and that would be uh, for China to do for North Korea what we do to keep South Korea and Japan from getting nuclear weapons. And that's extended, extended deterrence. deterrence. Mm -hmm. yeah. And basically China basically saying, you're giving up the weapons, but we as a declaratory policy uh, will extend uh, our guarantee for your, mm -hmm. your sovereignty. I have never heard that discussed, but it is a logical solution. I don't know how the US government would feel about it. Um, it but it's, it's, it's the only concept I see out there from a military strategic point of view uh, that I see getting towards uh, uh, negotiating. W one thing I should say is we have brought some of this on ourselves. Uh, I would say the single greatest non-proliferation disaster uh, that has uh, been inflicted on the world uh, is the combination of the overthrow of the Libyan government and the Iraqi government. Uh, having forced those governments to give up uh, nuclear weapons programs um, and then gone in and executed regime change. It just sends a terrible signal uh, to people in places like Iran or North Korea uh, that if only they had not uh, done that and gone along to get along, maybe they'd still be around. Um, and, and, and that's something I think we're going to be living with. Uh, I don't think we necessarily were thinking in those terms, in those situations, uh, but I know uh, the non-proliferation community uh, with the Libyan intervention uh, was certainly kind of looking askance and thinking this, this could send a very bad signal. Okay. Thank you. All right, we're going to open up to you now. I think there are mics uh, available. And if you would briefly introduce yourself, why don't we start over there on the <laughs> side? And um, why don't you tell us who you are and if you'd like to address your question to either one of the panelists. Um, my name is... Oh, Robbie Sianovich, I'm a student here at Goodwin College. Um, I'm taking well, thank environmental. Thank you for hosting us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm taking environmental studies, although I am a a, a decent student of um, history and um, a decent student of politics. Um, the one thing that I only heard really once was Japan's in. Um, uh, part in this whole equation. I, I would like to know what you guys think. It has been a very strong military power in the past, although after the war, it was forced to de demobilize. Um, um, but it was once interested in nuclear weapons, briefly, and it, historically speaking, has been great rivals with all three of the cultures. Yeah. Russia, mm -hmm. China, and the Koreans. Yeah, good question. So we have both Korea as a potential victim of North Korean activity, but Japan as a more, becoming a more independent actor in terms of its own national security. Do either of you want to make a brief comment on that? Well, I think that concern is well placed. Um, you know, uh, obviously under Abe, uh, uh, Japan is trying to uh, pursue what it's, it calls becoming a normal country. That is to say, to be able to uh, uh, broaden its defense uh, capabilities and uh, uh, policies. Uh, uh, the Japan is sitting on metric tons of separated plutonium, so it, it would take about, I don't know, that long for Japan to build a nuclear weapon. And one of the things that, the, that you allude to is that the North Korean tests 
uh, are strengthening domestically in Japan and in South Korea calls for uh, nuclear weapons development. So I, I think it's a problem. I think though that the U.S. and uh, Japan, uh, uh, with this current administration, have pretty strong. Uh, we have pr uh, we're doing a pretty good job of reassurance, and uh, so I'm hopeful about that. Oh, I I actually worry about uh, more so in some ways about our our friends in South Korea. Um, I don't think we're doing a very good job of reassurance with the South Koreans, and th that's our partner. You know, we're not fighting this war in San Francisco or San Antonio. We're fighting it in Seoul with a joint command. And while the North Koreans might not be able to reach Guam or, or Hawaii, uh, they can reach the 30,000 troops uh, uh, in South Korea and the 80,000 troops that are in Japan. And so I think rather than calling our uh, President Moon an appeaser, rather, uh, uh, you know, after test, calling Abe the day after and calling Moon four days later uh, after talking about renegotiating the trade agreement after a test, uh, not having a U.S. ambassador in South Korea, not that this person isn't confirmed, he, he or she isn't nominated. We're not doing a very good job of reassurance with our most important partner in the region. Uh, and if, if that doesn't improve, then that may add to the impulse to, uh, for them to go, go a different path. I, I agree with all that. Uh, I mean, the thing with Japan is uh, this requires, as they say in the uh, diplomacy business, some nuance. Uh, the, the Japanese, more than any other country, freak the Chinese out. It's as simple as that. Because of history, the Japanese just freak the Chinese out. Part of what U.S. and China confluence comes together is it's been the U.S. extended uh, alliance and extended nuclear deterrence that has kept Japan um, not a worry uh, independently for China. Uh, as Japanese domestic politics reacts against North Korea, um, this is actually, I think, the, the greatest source of leverage against China. Um, even if you look at the missile defense <coughs> systems, uh, that's something where the Chinese have, have you know, really, again, freaked out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have basically said to them, hey, <laughs> you didn't help solve the problem with North Korea. They're popping these things over the territory. That's not even a question anymore. So, I mean, we, we literally told the Chinese that their sensitivities on missile defense, we're not even talking about that. We're beyond that. Um, that causes the Chinese a great deal of anxiety. Uh, the prospect of Japan in particular, uh, as, as Jim says, Japan has uh, pursued a virtual nuclear capability, um, a nuclear hedge, as we call it. Um, it can become a nuclear weapons power, a major nuclear weapons power, uh, very quickly. China knows that. Um, so that's a, that's a, that's a stick. Um, the problem is it's a stick that freaks the Chinese out so much that it could be very and easily Further destabilizing <laughs> for the region. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, right here in the front row. Thank you. Good morning for being here. You're both you. wonderful. You. Don't you think North Korea and Kim Il-sung Il are basically kind of a proxy antagonist for Iran and perhaps China, who loves to see they've passed missile information over to the Koreans, North Koreans. They passed... Uh, uh, even the technology for developing nuclear weapons to the North Koreans. So the, they're sitting back and watching us to see how we deal with North Korea and wondering, is North Korea going to solve all the problems for them? Uh, let me speak to that briefly. Um, first on uh, Iran, you know, sort of this triangle. I Iran and uh, North Korea cooperated on missile technology in the early years, but, and I've testified on this issue before Congress. Uh, not on nuclear development. Uh, you know, the D uh, DNI, uh, IAEA, Congressional Research Service, uh, everyone who's looked at this has not found nuclear cooperation. And most of the missile cooperation, although that's always subject to change, uh, was in years past. Uh, do I think uh, that uh, in some ways China is using North Korea as a tool? And to this, I'm, uh, I'm, with all respect, I'm just going to say that's not my view. Uh, I think. 
the Chinese have had, a, 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 the problem with the Chinese is they underestimated the North Koreans for years and years. Little brother can't do this. They're poor and backwards, and are, this is not a problem. Uh, I, you've really seen a shift in Chinese thinking over the last three years. I mean, they've signed off to, and of course they're not fully enforced, but they've signed off to UN Security Council resolutions I thought they would never do. And they've been playing with the oil and gasoline spigot as well. And so they are doing things. And why are they doing things? Because what North Korea is doing undermines them. Every time they have a test, it makes China look weak because the Chinese are saying, don't do this, and the North Koreans say, you know. And then, as we said, it's strengthening hawks mm. in uh, South Korea and Japan. And if those countries were to go nuclear, that is not in China's uh, self-interest. Uh, there are all sorts of ways in which this is bad for China. But the only thing worse for China than that is to have a failed nuclear weapon state on your border, uh, to have a major war, a war that the North Koreans will lose and that South Korean and US forces could conceivably come up to the Chinese border. So they, uh, when the Chinese say they want denuclearization, they're serious. And I've talked to enough Chinese officials to believe that, or at least foreign ministry officials, so we'll bracket that, uh, to believe that they are sincere in that. Uh, the problem is they're between a rock and a hard place. They don't want collapse. Collapse is bad, bad, bad for them, even as they hate everything that North Korea is doing. That's mm -hmm. sort of. Do I see another question in the back? Uh, further in the back row, please. Yes? The woman in the middle with the row? Yeah. Okay. Two fists. You can do this in stereo, yes. Would you? It's a very good question. Um, we will use what we have to the extent it is useful, and we will uh, take the posture uh, that it is useful as we can uh, portray it as being, um, because that is part of a deterrent uh, posture. Uh, I'm not a technical expert on missile defense, um, but based on the capabilities that we have uh, deployed and the challenges involved, um, we. I think are in a very good position uh, to use that as part of a deterrent against a North Korean action in the near term. Um, uh, but if North Korea uh, becomes a, an actual robust uh, nuclear power, so uh, an India or Pakistan uh, level nuclear power with road mobile uh, solid fuel missiles that are hard to find uh, as that technology develops, uh, they will get to a point where they can develop an offensive posture um, that may be able to overwhelm any defensive posture, at least under current architecture, unless we, we it's not a really point, changed yeah. our, our missile defense into uh, a, a very different uh, posture. Can I speak more? plainly and say, <laughs> no. The answer is no. Uh, I understand the sensitivities here. Uh, we can try to do a, with Aegis and some other things point defense. If we know where they're going to right. send it, so we can say. sort of maybe defend it. But generally, no, no. And you know, I think I get this question all the time. You know, why don't we shoot down their missiles now? And, and uh, here's why. If, they, if we try to shoot, remember, THAAD has never been used in a war, wartime conflict, right? And missile defense is very specific to the missile you are trying to shoot down. Uh, I don't have any confidence in the system. So the reason why we don't shoot down these missiles now, and I get this question a lot, is because there are two possible outcomes. One is we'll miss. And if we miss, you know, you can almost kiss extended deterrence goodbye. I mean, not really, but, you know, if they see that the emperor has no clothes, they're going to be a lot more nervous. And number two, the second outcome is we hit it. Right? And so what happens after that? Then the pressure is going to be to shoot down every one of them until we miss. And then you're back at number one. And I think uh, in the so. Iraq war, we found, and of course the technology wasn't as advanced as it is today, but in hindsight, we thought we had done this anti-SCUD uh, defense, particularly for the Israelis. And I think when you look back at the record, it was less than 50% success hit rate. But so these are things yeah. I don't say to a yeah. South Korean or Japanese yeah. audience. I don't say. <laughs> All right, other questions? Uh, over here, please. 
Can we get a mic over here? How about this, this side? Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this side one? I didn't see anything. a little love over here. All right. Any questions from this side as well? I'll, I'll, we'll go here first and then um, warm up your, you know, get warmed up and get ready for a question. And we are going to run out of time in a few minutes. So given that the stance of, of the United States and North Korea still reflects the post-Korean War uh, conflict, so I, I think that is there a hope that maybe a, a resolving this situation under the, under the rubric of finally resolving that conflict since it formally mm -hmm. hasn't been resolved, right. does that offer maybe a more holistic way to uh, incorporate this aspect, the kind of denuclearization of the peninsula into uh, a more uh, full resolution of it. Yeah. Well, the, the, the North Koreans are constantly a asking for a peace treaty, and that's what yeah. this is about. As you all know, we have an armistice. We have a cessa cessation of hostilities, but there was never a peace agreement. There was right. never a peace agreement. We were or a reunification yeah, plan. We're, we're yeah. still technically at war. Right. It's, it was a talking point for the North Koreans for a long time. I think uh, uh, you know the U.S. at different points has been open to it, particularly people in government. When they're in government, say, no, we can't do it. And then when they leave government, they say, we should think about it. Uh, but it also de means, it, it depends on what you mean by a peace treaty, right? So it, the North Koreans, what they mean is the US withdraws all its forces. That's not going to happen. But I think it is a path worth pursuing. If only, again, again, my main concern, inadvertent war. So anything that gets us talking that allows for communication to reduce that threat, I'm in favor of. Other questions? We had a chance over here. Jim you know, is trying I came to help to you. Defense, Jim is trying to help you. And I see questions hanging. here. Let's uh, uh, here and then on the on the aisle after that, and then we'll wrap up. In fact, why don't I take the two questions back to back, if that's all right? Yeah, that makes and sense. And one and uh, okay, Katya. Okay, please. Good morning. My name is uh, Joe Sawyer, and uh, it's my understanding the Trump administration is. Is, is concerned about Iran in the sense that, uh, okay, they're adhering to the uh, nuclear agreement right now, but on the other hand, uh, Iran is supporting the Taliban, they're supporting Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, North Korea, the Shiites in, in Iraq. Now, so if they're supporting the Taliban, how are we going to end the war in Afghanistan how do we get Iran to stop this behavior? Okay. Because if we can't trust them by supporting these terrorists, can we really trust them with this nuclear program? Okay. Why don't we take the question on the gentleman on the aisle? Good morning. My name is Michael Thomas. So it, it's a similar question. I mean, we've talked so you've talked so far about. Um, non-proliferation non among state actors, but the sort of elephant in the room is, how does this calculus change when you start to take into consideration non-state actors? And the increasing um, availability of technical data that would allow non-state actors to become participants. Thank you. And last question here. Um, we spoke about precedents uh, earlier of what, you know, Libya, um, uh, the actions um, in Libya did. But what would be the precedent uh, that we create um, by leaving the Iran deal? And I, I wonder if, you know, North Korea and China is looking at our actions and how you can enter into a negotiation when things, you know, when the U.S. has walked away from an agreement which is, you know, um, Iran is complying to. Um, so what does that create in terms of future negotiations with the U.S.? Okay. So I'm going to ask our two speakers to wrap in their final two minutes each uh, responses to these questions. So if, if I could, um, well, but we're going to try anyway. Uh, we want to not uh, take the time of the next panel particularly the question of non-proliferation and non-state actors, I think might be a good one for you, of have we thought through what to do about loose nukes or nuclear materials that get in the hands of other than sovereign states? And if you want to maybe look more comprehensively at the costs of uh, the failure of the Iran agreement, what would the cost be? 
Yeah, I think the non-state actor, I mean, that has been uh, a subject of serious attention. As a matter of fact, I would argue uh, after the 9-11 attacks, uh, one of the big transformations in U.S. Uh, national security policy is we'd, we'd had this threat of nuclear proliferation. We'd had this threat of terrorism. Uh, they were both existing threats sort of on, on a secondary uh, level, and 9-11 uh, kind of fused our imagination of those streams crossing, and suddenly that became uh, a dominant preoccupation. Uh, that remains the case. The fact of the matter is, though, that there's a relationship between the state actors who uh, can uh, be sponsors or supporters of terrorism. Um, so there's, there's a bit of a chicken and, and egg problem. Um, Iran, North Korea, uh, these are countries that are of a concern in terms of them resorting to uh, that sort of tactic. Uh, so, you know, the idea in theory is you prevent those states who have affiliations with that sort of tactic from getting it and you've solved the problem. But it, it is a much wider problem. Uh, on the Iran, again, I should say I, I, uh, I do not support pulling out of the agreement at this point. Uh, I, I simply don't think the agreement should be counted on as having solved the problem. Uh, but one thing that I do hope, uh, in answer to your direct question, uh, that international uh, partners uh, dealing with the United States understand is get a treaty. An executive agreement is not the way to get an enduring agreement that the United States will adhere to. It's a shortcut. It can get you over the finish line. It's a temptation. But in the end, uh, it is not the way to go. Get a treaty. It's really hard under our system. That's by design. Once we sign a treaty, we adhere to it. Jim? You're such a dreamer. I love that about you. <laughs> we can't get 67 votes on a bill that says it's light during the day and it's dark at night. Uh, you know, but you know, whatever. Um, obviously, if we you know, uh, break the agreement. I mean, again, I said agreements work based on an expectation that all parties get benefits. And if you have a track record of pulling out, then, you know, people aren't going to be very confident, especially if you're bargaining with a weaker power. That's part of the problem here, is we're dealing with a, uh, not a peer competitor, and I'm glad there are no peer competitors, but we're dealing with a weaker power who thinks that we're going to screw them in the end. So it would send, obviously, a terrible message. Let me come back because I didn't want to ignore your question, which is very important. It's certainly true that Iran supports proxies. Uh, Hezbollah uh, has given some support to Hamas that's gone up and down. It's clearly involved uh, in uh, Syria. Of course, we are, have funded extremists to fight against Assad, not through the DOD program, but through the CIA in Syria. And the uh, Saudis and the Gutteries got, uh, got in before we did. Believe me, if you study the history of the Middle East, you see a lot of proxies, you know, uh, going back to Saddam and the Shah. Oh, that's in Afghanistan, too. Yeah, right. Uh, and I think our problem in Afghanistan is not Iran, it's Pakistan. Pakistan is the center of gravity there in the Haqqani network. So I think, and that's a real tough nut to crack. But let me speak to the issue of Iran's role in the region and how that relates to the uh, nuclear agreement. Quickly. You know, Iran does a lot of bad things that we don't like. And it seems to me the only thing worse than an Iran that does bad things we don't like is an Iran that does bad things we don't like and has a nuclear weapon, <laughs> right? This is a nuclear agreement. It wasn't supposed to solve all the problems that we face. Uh, and the U.S. has plenty of policy tools that it can use to deal with that particular issue of uh, uh, regional activity. And I don't take it as a proxy for whether they'll stick with the, uh, the nuclear agreement, right? Because we don't, this isn't based on trust. Trust has nothing to do with any of this. It's based on verification. It's based on electronic monitors that are in those centrifuges and enrichment facilities that are there t running 24-7, 365. It's based on the inspectors. It's based on all those, on destroying things. I mean, if you destroy the Iraq reactor, it's destroyed. There's really no going back there, right? So. Again, uh, Iran does things I don't like, as does China and Russia and a ho whole bunch of other countries. But uh, good diplomacy and uh, smart national security policy finds a way to minimize the dangers, to cooperate on areas where we have common ground and to compete like hell in the areas where we disagree. And so I say the Iran agreement's a victory and we should consolidate it uh, and then move on to our other problems. Because if that whole thing comes unraveled, 
you know, at the same time, this is over here in North Korea and that's over here someplace else, I think it's going to be very difficult. So I think we could keep going with these two wonderful speakers, but I don't want to interrupt the program any further. I want to thank you all, and please join me in thanking the wonderful Jim Walsh, the wonderful Dave Cooper. Thanks very much. Great. Great.